Welcome. We're happy to have you here with us today for one of our coffee chats. I'm Amy Klaus, Marketing Manager for Early Childhood Products here at Brooks Publishing, and I'm very happy to have Dr. Angie Tomlin and Dr. C. V. Wig joining us today to talk about supporting families in uncertain times. Before we start, I just have a few tips to help you listen to the webinar today. So we recommend you close any applications that use bandwidth or resources just so you have a better viewing experience. If you have any questions during the webinar, please go ahead and submit them in your webinar panel on the right-hand side and we'll take those questions at the end in a um, Q&A format. And if you have any audio problems listening through your computer speakers, um, we recommend you switch to using telephone audio. That usually helps clear up any um, distortion issues you may be hearing. The slide handouts for today's presentation are um, again in your webinar panel on the right hand side and there's also a link in the chat box if you're unable to download those. We are recording today's session and it will be a link will be sent out in an email tomorrow as well as a link to your certificate for attending today's coffee chat. So thank you, welcome Angie and Steve, thanks for joining us. Thanks thank for you. having So Angie, why don't well, you dive thank in? Thank you, Amy. Okay, great. But thanks, Amy, for that nice introduction. And thank you, Brooks, for letting us be here today to share some ideas about how we can help families facing that uncertainty that we're all dealing with right now. Thinking about uncertainty, Steve and I talked quite a bit about this. And we, you know, we we think that a lot of what's happening for us is that we're all missing the routine and the predictability of what I guess we could call our normal lives or our before lives. It's hard for everyone when we really don't know what's gonna happen next or when all of these things that are different will be ending. We're unsure if we are people that we care very deeply about are safe. And so as a result, I think many of us feel restless, anxious, and unsettled as we try to navigate this um, new situation. I think uh, for me, it's really helpful to about everything that's going on and our reactions to it using a trauma lens, which lots of us are familiar with right now because we've learned a lot about ACEs. So just as a reminder, you know, anxiety is a normal response when things are not as we are used to them being. We, you know, we all feel that. It's also a necessary human reaction. And if we don't have some um, capacity to recognize and respond to anxiety, then we wouldn't survive a real threat. But what's you know, problematic for us is when our sense and our feelings of anxiety become too high um, or too frequent. And then it's difficult for us to find the ways that we would normally be able to cope with that kind of sensation or feeling. So that's really what's going on for us right now. And it's important for us to recognize that. And our sense is that in this strange time of COVID is that we're maybe noticing our own anxieties or anxiety in other people in some different ways that we might not normally see just because this is an unusual situation. So it does help to really understand that, to step back and just to see it for what it is. Yeah, absolutely, Steve. I'm, I'm waiting for you to advance slides. Uh, perfect. Um, the other thing that I think we might want to recognize together is that this pandemic is just not an equal opportunity disruptor. So some groups of folks are bearing a much higher burden uh, with regard to the changes and the restrictions and so forth than others are. So that's one piece. And then the other piece is that um, our perceptions of any situation really vary. So all of us are feeling different levels of threat, even if it were possible to have everything be equal. So you would want to think about the history of the individual or a particular cultural group um, to understand how they might be responding, a person might respond individuals' beliefs, attitudes about situations, um, how much support you have, whether that's practical or emotional. You know, those are different types of support and both very important in our own personal coping capacity that we can bring to bear when we encounter a situation like this. And all of that adds up to say, we're all gonna respond differently to um, what's happening, even though it, it may be hard for all of us. Okay. So taking all of that into consideration, we can also recognize that people are responding very differently. And that's helpful for us when we see somebody who's or reacting to the situation in a different way than we are. 
So some some people are you know really mad and angry that they're being restricted, but other people are like wanting even more caution. You know, I was on my um I was on my Zoom book club this week, and this all played out. Some of my members were um, saying they're really not ready to go out for a very long time, and others were ready to go out like right now. So some people can't even tolerate thinking about this whole situation at all. Uh, and the other thing to bear in mind, I think, is that a person, you know, might be in one place at one moment and a different place in another moment. So our feelings can change very quickly. You'll hear this even when you talk to your friends. Maybe on one day they're telling you they're ready to go do something, and another day they're, you know, really saying we're, we're in this for the long haul and we're quarantined. So it's helpful if we can do our very best to maintain that perspective that all of our all of our sense of what's happening is very different. Um, it's nice to be kind and respectful of different viewpoints when we can. And we know that just trying to scare another person into taking on our viewpoint is really unlikely to change their mind. They're gonna, uh, that may in fact even cause a person to hunker down and cling even more tightly to the belief system that they have. And I like your point about being respectful of different viewpoints, especially during this time, because we really have no idea what is all on people's minds. Because I'm thinking about some of the folks that I talk to are very aware of their own medical issues, perhaps, or their kids' issues, or they're trying to be available to help other family members. And so they might have, there might be some variations in what's causing them to act the way they are or to have the viewpoints that they have that we just might not be aware of. And that could be really influencing things that we just wouldn't even know about maybe medical conditions that people have or that are in their family that are influencing their availability to open up, as it were, as some of our states are doing now. That's a good point, Steve. Yeah. Okay. Let's carry on and talk a little bit more about this idea. I wanted to mention um, little kids and how they may be responding to this. So we, you know, we mentioned that adults are having a hard time. You know, I don't go to my office. I'm not places that I'm no, used to being. Same for children. They may be confused or even sad about the changes in their routine. Um, they could be just like us and missing seeing their friends or, you know, well-known childcare providers, their extended family like grandparents. Um, there's a sense of loss for events that we're not able to go to. Even young children might have had a you know, preschool graduation or a little recital that they're not going to be able to do that they planned and hoped for for a long time. I think it's really rough, um, and some of you who are home visitors may have seen this, for little kids to understand the virtual aspects of situation that we're in. Um, I hear from a lot of uh, family case managers and other early interventionists who are saying that young children um, may not want to stay on the screen for a long time for a virtual visit or a therapy session. We just don't really understand it. I think young kids may be um, very confused about how everything looks different. Um, people are wearing masks or um, we're doing, you know, we're not able to go into certain buildings like we're used to. I have a um, great niece who is two years that was a hard thing to say. She's two, but um, I was talking with her virtually and she was talking about going to the library um, and how she was going to be touching everything. And it really struck me that she's two and she wants to go to a special place that she's used to and act in her normal way. So we can see that young children may show their distress, you know, not clearly in words, but they may show it by behavioral changes or even loss of skills or regression. So it's useful to pay attention to the play and see if there are any clues about what they're really missing or what's bothering them. Or even younger kids who are who are verbal, if you can ask them what do they miss and they may be able to give you some ideas about what they wish they could be doing. And I was thinking about right. my own situation where my my grandson is four and he's very used to coming over and hanging out with us to play because that's what we like to do. And we we at the beginning we really couldn't even talk to him on the phone because he wanted to know when he could come over and he really didn't understand what this was about and when we were able to see him with our socially as much as we could distancing you know he said i miss you and so i think it was important for me to say i miss you too because we don't get to play but just to normalize it this is weird and unusual for all of us but that um to just acknowledge that we that we do miss each other and that we can do things in some different ways. Yeah. All 
All right, so we're going to shift and start talking about things that we can do to help um, ourselves and families uh, tolerate what's going on and maybe even have a chance to um, have a little growth. So the first thing that Steve and I thought would be important to acknowledge is uh, what that young children are reliant on positive, supportive primary relationships in order to grow and develop. In, in a corollary to that, positive relationships can buffer trauma and also can really help kids grow and heal from difficult experiences. So all that boils down to the fact that parent and other caregiver support is really essential to a child's ability to cope and to develop resilience for difficult situations. So um, one thing we like to say is that helping parents and other caregivers always helps young children. It's a key to young child well-being. All right. So Steve just really kind of explained this, this point beautifully. One way to adapt and cope is to find ways to stay connected to people who matter to you. So we can reach out to them virtually, which is nice, through virtual contacts. Um, I've been doing like these fake coffee dates with my friends on Zoom. You can have virtual play dates with little kids. I think a, a text or any other short message can show that you're holding someone in mind. And I did want to mention that old school contacts like phone, like actual phone calls and snail mail is really helpful. Um, this picture that we have up here are my grandchildren. And this is a photo, um, an actual hard copy photo that I got for Mother's Day. Um, it was very meaningful to me to have something that I could hold and touch and think about how um, much I miss them, but it helped me feel close to them. It's on my, I actually have it right here in a little frame. I would encourage people to think about some of those those range of ways to feel connected and um, and close, even though we're not as able to be connected as we or would love. And just last night we were at our house having a virtual talk with the eight year old granddaughter. And at the beginning of of the pandemic, her mom had the suggestion that she write letters to people. So we all got a letter from my granddaughter. And so we wrote back right away. In fact, I wrote several things and sent a couple of letters and have been waiting to get something back. And so when I've talked to her and again last night, I said, I'm still waiting for my letter. You know, when are you going to write back to me? And and she just <laughs> smiles. And she said, well, it's yeah. too hard to write that. It takes a long time. And so, but it's at least the connection. I think it's just ways that we can find other ways that we can talk about things. And in those virtual contexts, one thing my wife has started doing is to read to her. She's eight, and so they picked mm -hmm. out a book. And so that's another way that they can connect. So they're doing that every few days. And that's it's a way to meet both of our needs because we as grandparents want to connect, but she just that's a different way she can connect with us too. That's an online way. So I think all of those ideas are they're creative yeah. ways that we can try to figure out how do we do those connections because they're very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So we have a few more ideas, so we'll carry on here. Um, a concept that we think a lot about for, for young children, but for adults too, is how important our routine and our rituals are. So another way to help you cope in an uncertain time is to think about creating a new frame or a new structure that is can help us promote feelings of safety and predictability. Now, for me, I think it's really important to keep it simple and not get too ambitious. People want to make these very extensive, elaborate schedules, and, and that's um, probably not the best thing right now. I just don't think we can take a cognitive load. So you want to think flexible and forgiving in the kind of schedule that you, you create for yourself. Again, ask kids what things they're missing and build in some choice making so that kids can have some decision making about what they want to do and when they want to do it. I heard a nice idea about just using um, post-it notes that kids could rearrange and make the schedule the way they wanted it to be um, within the parameters that the parents set. And I think that would be a nice way for kids to feel a little bit of control in a situation that feels very out of control right now. And I would add, I think that we've talked a lot about when coming up with a schedule or a new a new order of things at home that it can be just for what you need to do at home that i hear a lot of families in in this time where they're at home with the kids are trying to recreate preschool or school and trying to work and trying to maintain their house and that's pretty ambitious that that's about how could you just make it simple and i like the idea of like how do we let the kids have some involvement in that and some choice making 
so that they can buy into the schedule, but just so that we get through the day and do the things that are that we have to get done. Right. All right. Um, another thing that helps us that we know from successfully coping individuals or those who are resilient is that um, they have cognitive ways to help themselves. So one thing we can say to ourselves is this is really hard. Um, this is really hard. Nobody picked it. This isn't what any of us would maybe have wished. A second thing that helps with your coping is to, to parse out for yourself what things are in your control and which things are not in, in your control. If you're looking for a nice activity for young children to really make this explicit, um, my sister's an art therapist and she shared with me an activity where you draw, you draw an outline of your hand, put inside it the things that are in control and outside of the things that are not control. And even a young child can do this with an adult helping them to draw pictures or to write the things that are in and out and in outside of their control. And again, that tangible um, physical activity is very grounding and, and it's uh, important in coping. And the third thing I would say about this type of coping is that um, whenever we're thinking of trauma experiences, the narrative or the meaning of what happened to us is often important. And this is no different. So there are many ways that people can find meaning in a, in a challenging circumstance. It might be their, through their personal spirituality, um, thinking about a sense of community, such as, you know, we all, we wear a mask to help each other and protect all of us, or actually doing something um, to help another person, like dropping off a, some cookies to your neighbor. So any of those kinds of things that bring meaning to the circumstances that we were in, uh, that we're in right now are helpful. Angie, I'm really struck by your example of the drawing the hand and and doing that together because it's a nice demonstration of um, I think for kids to know that that we're in this together and it's hard for both of us and to talk about the things that are hard. What a nice way to make that work. Yes, I think that's a good good example. And maybe we could do yeah, it amongst mine right here. <laughs> we did it in our office. Um, and it was really nice. It's one of the first things we did as a mindfulness activity in our office. Okay. Um, another way of helping us feel more resilient or adaptive is to communicate what we do and do not know. And I think it's really connected to what we can control and not control. The amount of information that we have changes frequently. So we want to stick with, uh, with young kids of explaining in a really concrete way what we know. So right now, many of us might say that we know there are certain things we can do to stay safe, such as wearing a mask or not getting too close to other people. We can also very explicitly and verbally model good coping, um, saying I'm having a hard day right now and what I'm gonna do to take care of myself is take a walk around the block. And again, keeping it simple uh, when you're explaining things to young children is helpful. There are um, lots of kinds of information available to talk to kids about the virus and so forth. And I think we wanna use our child uh, questions and concerns as a guide for that and not overload them with too much information or information that they might not be in a place to hear at that moment. So, so these are some things that we can do around communication to help us with adaptation and coping. And it strikes me that in order for us to keep it simple with, the, with our kids, is that we need to figure out how we what we do for ourselves too, right? So that we're not anxious about it and trying to mm -hmm. and our over simplification or answering questions that it's more for our need than for their need. So how do you keep that in perspective too? That I'm answering things for myself, but then I'm available to answer my kids' it's, questions. Yeah. Answer what they're asking about. Absolutely, and, and probably related to that is we, we don't want kids hearing a lot of angst that grownups may be having about this. I think being honest with them and explaining things in simple terms and talking about coping is useful, but they don't need to hear lots and lots of news about every minute detail of what's going on. Um, I like to say a little constructive denial can also come in handy for us as, as adults. We might just need to take a break from the information of overload and the um, rhetoric that is going on. So it's kind of okay to just be a little bit, um, sit on your back, stoop or whatever you have, look outside, breathe a little fresh air and reduce your social media and other media time if it's just getting to be too much for you. And I think it's good for us to say that too. I know that even as Angie and I work together, um, we've, we've said to our colleagues, that it's okay if you need to take a break, you know, that that would be all right. If you needed to not do something someday or you couldn't be at a meeting at a certain time because you just need to 
get yourself uh, some space and come together, that's okay. That it's important that we take care of ourselves. And, and that's another way of modeling for our kids that sometimes we have to just take care of ourselves first and then we can be available. And that that's what they could do too. If they're not available right now, they could take a break and then they could come back. So kind of sounds simple, but sometimes the really basic things are the most helpful. So focusing on um, what is going well when you can, but if, and allowing um, and validating negative feelings when you just need that moment. I think we've all had our grown-up meltdowns and breakdowns, um, and I'm sure that our kids are no different, and the families that we support are no different. Uh, being silly and having a good laugh can go a long way and can do a lot of good. If you can, you know, your maybe your child says, "I miss going." ways to develop coping skills and promote growth is really helpful and the goal is to be good enough as steve was saying not to be perfect mm -hmm. not, none of us are going to manage that especially right. now i think uh, we have yeah so as we're moving toward the end of our pre presentation time um, and getting toward question and answer we wanted to make sure that none of us forgot to take care of our own selves as steve was starting to lead us down so if we want to be ready to support families and children, then we have to, you know, get ourselves in the best shape that we can be in. Um, something that I've thought a lot about is that I think it's important to recognize that we're trying to learn a whole new way of being and of working and of managing under a very, very stressful situation. So this is not the time when our minds are most open to learning new things. So it's important that we accept that we more than likely can't do as much as we'd like to do. Um, I thought I was gonna get a lot of work done in my house. Didn't happen, not yet, after 10 weeks. We should know that this electronic uh, format that we're all working under is actually very cognitively taxing. So Zoom or whatever you wanna call it brain is real. Um, and you might feel more tired than if you were doing your face-to-face -face interaction. And we know that we have to become aware of and think about managing our own thoughts, responses, and behaviors in order to be present and be as helpful as we can in, in the work that we're doing. So when we slow down and think about creating opportunities for mindfulness, that can really help us a lot. So um, our last slide, I think, is talking about a process that Steve and I developed. And I'm gonna let Steve talk about this because I, I always think he's better at it than me. Well, <laughs> and as Angie's talking about our the need for us as providers, as caregivers, as family members to to slow down and to be aware of all this stuff, I have found that this method that we talked about in our book to support home visitors called the pause is really a useful framework to try to keep in mind all those things that we're trying to keep in mind and to, and to buffer it. So if we can use reflection and think about the ex not only our own experiences, which we should pay attention to, but the experiences of the kids that we're supporting and their, and their caregivers, that gives us some insight about how we can most help them. And we thought it might be helpful to think about that in this way. And we came up with the moniker pause, which would first for us be to, to perceive, to just observe and listen to what's going on and pay attention to the things that we're seeing and then wonder. And maybe we would ask some questions to learn more about what's happening in the situation. And then with that information to understand what's happening from different perspectives. So first, from my perspective. So this is what I see and what I think is happening. But how might it be perceived and understood by the child? How are they experiencing what's happening in whatever the situation is? And what about the caregivers, their parents or whoever's with them? How are they perceiving it? And with that understanding, it might open up some opportunities to think about what could we do to strategize some ways to, to solve whatever the issue is. And then in that process, we should always be thinking about, well, how will we know if our strategies work? So that's how we have the S and the E for our pause to strategize and to evaluate. And certainly we could think about this from lots of perspectives, lots of things that are coming up because um, kids may be having some challenges with their behavior because they're in a different situation. It's not what they are used to. Um, everybody's anxiety is high. So how could we better understand what's happening by slowing down and seeing the different perspectives to just be able to to understand and maybe address the behavior that way or they may have trouble regulating maybe they're not sleeping as well they're not eating or they're having some challenges because there's a lot going on 
And we do think if you can slow down and, and use a framework to help sort out what's happening and to better understand it, that that could better inform some solutions. And even just the process of looking at it can bring up some insights and some ahas. And it doesn't matter what the situation is, is what I'm finding, is when I'm talking with folks, whether it's about their issue with their child or about their own issues or about you know what's happening in their family or with their work, if we use this sort of model to slow down and think about it from everyone's perspective, it can help inform solutions in some different ways without me having to say, here's what you should do. People can think about those solutions on their own. So what would you add to that, Angie? Um, well, first of all, that was great, Steve. But again, I, you know, what I, I like about thinking about it this way is it just gives us a frame. Um, and whenever you have a frame, you feel safer and a little more regulated yourself. This is just, I think that's the main key for me. All right. So well, in we are about to the point. Of, yes, of sharing. Uh, the, the resource that brought us with you today is the, the uh, book that we put together, which not only talks about this framework, but it does have lots of practical things that you can use when you're talking uh, to kids, or to families, mm -hmm. or to other providers about some of these situations. Like, what are some things that we would know about dealing with regulation issues, like sleeping and eating, or about behavior, or about other family issues? So using that framework against uh, some, some practical things that could be of some help to you. Great. So thank you so much, Angie and Steve. Those are very good tips, both for us as adults right. and then... See, Amy is back. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, good tips for all of us as adults and for all the kids that we work with and my little kid at home. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I'm happy to let everyone know that we're going to be giving away three copies of Angie and Steve's book, Tackling the Tough Stuff. So everyone listening today will be randomly entered into a drawing and then we'll be contacting three winners afterwards. Um, I'll also mention if you have a question for Angie and Steve, please go ahead and start typing those into the question box, and I'll, we'll take those in just a few minutes. Um, and we're also giving all of our listeners today a 20% discount on any of the Brooks products. You can just use that Coffee Talk code to order a copy of Angie and Steve's book or any other books that you might like. We are running, we've been running these coffee chats throughout the month of April and May, and so we have a big archive of coffee chats on various early childhood products, so I encourage you um, to check them out. And then we also created a COVID-19 resources page for early childhood professionals that had some recommended readings and handouts you can share with parents and some other webinars, so um, just some helpful resources we kind of gathered. So now I'd like to kind of start our Q&A session. So, um, get some types in. Um, I'm having some people are writing in thank you for good tips, great self-care advice and coping skills. Um, we, I'm having, um, one listener asked if you could give an example on using pause in like in a certain situation, of how you could use the framework. Sure, um, I'll t I can take a, a shot at that. So um, we actually had a, a number of vignettes where we explain it in our, in our text, but um, so, for example, if you were a home visitor and you were working with a family where um, you were like something that often happens to me is that I'm, you know, really not clear on exactly um, what might be happening the way a parent is experiencing the child's behavior. So I might want to slow myself down instead of getting overreactive about it myself, like the child is backing up, but I think they're being fairly normal for their age, and I think the parents are overreacting, so like in my head. So I might want to slow myself down and take a look at what's happening, observe more closely, wonder about what it is going on for the parent. Maybe they're embarrassed. Maybe they think that, you know, if their child has a temper tantrum at age two, it means they're not a good parent. I might explore that a little bit with the parent by asking them some questions, and then um, I might try to understand what it's like for the child. Is the child just trying to have a good time and just being a little kid, or maybe there is something going on? Then uh, with the parent, I might think about some ideas that would be helpful, maybe an education piece, or maybe just talking to the parent about their ideas on child rearing and their expectations for kids. And then I might um, think about some things that we could do together. And then I would decide in my head um, what, what, I, what would make this a successful intervention and what I would be looking for for an evaluation. I hope that's a helpful, quick 
example of how you could do that. Okay. And I would add to that, I mean, you could use that same idea that Andrew was just talking about and think about it from other perspectives, like maybe a child care center. So when I've been talking to some child care directors, and I'm just using this framework to help them think through this, they're wondering about like when kids come back to our program and we begin to reopen, what are we gonna, what's it gonna be like? So we could imagine what are some of the things that are happening for kids and for families yes. to better understand that. And then we can talk through maybe trying to understand what's happening in the family as we offer some suggestions about how they're gonna, how they could cope. And it's within the context of understanding all those pieces. And we think a lot about the parallel process so that if, if mm -hmm. I'm attending to the parent or I'm attending to the childcare provider and, and how they're thinking about this, maybe it's in supervision or it's just in my direct practice, I'm hoping and expecting that that kind of thinking is going to translate to how the family will think about the kids' experience so that they'll do the same thing and they'll wonder about how they should react and what they should do, paying attention not only to their own issues, but maybe how their children are experiencing mm -hmm. what's happening. Thank you. And when you were talking, Steve, that reminded me, um, for anybody who does reflective supervision or consultation or receives it, you can use that um, model to, when you're speaking with your supervisor, to kind of outline, you know, what might be happening with you and a family and to give you a framework for reflecting back on that experience. So that's another way you could use it. All right, Amy. <laughs> Great. All right. We have a couple more questions. So um, one listener is asking, are there any current recommendations on the length of virtual meetings? Um, for everyone or for children or? Well, uh, I don't think um, the listener is not specific, but maybe like a virtual meeting with a family and a child probably would be helpful to know for all listeners. Um yeah i have not seen any formal recommendations coming out of like literature or anything i know that our part c program in indiana has allowed our um providers who are doing virtual visits to separate them into two half hours because it was felt that that was a little bit better for the families and for the children to make it through so I, that's the only guidance that i've seen then the other thing that I would say that I noticed personally is at the beginning, I would like stack up my meetings back to back with no that is very unwise. Um, you wanna, you know, in, in real life, hopefully you have a moment to end a meeting, like get to some closure for that thing and then prepare to start your next one. And if you try to can carry on without allowing yourself to have those moments, I think it's very, very difficult and it increases your cognitive load and you'll be very tired and I don't think it's effective. I don't know if that's a direct answer, but those are some things I think about when I try to structure time. Um, just wanna jump in. So when you were answering about the time for when working with families for virtual home visits, the audio cut out just for a minute. So mm -hmm. I actually missed, was it, do you say half an hour mm -hmm. or an hour? Um, yeah, our, I said our PT program had separated the one hour visits into two 30 minute segments. Okay, great. Just wanted to clarify if, I, if in case other people lost that audio too. Great. Um, Thank you. Do, you. do you have any suggestions to help parents who are working with their child schooling at home? So parents that are kind of trying to do the homeschooling with young children. Angie looks frozen. So, I um, so uh, one thing that I've read is, <laughs> oh, Am I still frozen? We can hear yeah. you now. I'm okay. Okay, sorry. You can see from the photo, I'm out in the country. That's my, that's in my backyard. So um, the first thing I would say is that we are not doing homeschooling. Um, we are doing a substitute for home school, or we're doing a substitute for school because most people are not prepared in that way. And so I think that that's one thing to hold in mind. And then I think you want to give yourself again a little forgiveness. Um, you're not going to be able to suddenly overnight turn into, you know, create the system. So there's so many challenges. I'm not even sure where to, where to begin. Uh, one of the things that I've heard a number of families talk about is that, again, children, you know, children are having trouble with the virtual aspect of this. So in some cases, I've and this is not from research, but just from anecdotally, I've heard that some younger children 
are doing better with um, hard copies of materials and use, you know, for that tangible piece. Um, I'm on the board of a recovery high school, which would be a high school that serves um, adolescents who have a substance use disorder. And that population also has given feedback that they prefer something more tangible to, to do their work on. So I don't know, Steve, do you have other thoughts? Well, I would just expand on the notion that the goal is not really to replace school. I think it's okay if families are, as we went, we talked earlier about schedules so that you figure out a schedule and you try to meet whatever the requirements are of how the school is asking students to respond. And there's a wide variation from what I'm hearing about the school's ability and their, mm -hmm. how they're asking students, depending on their age, um, whether they're doing activities or the how they're connecting or what they're trying to do. But I think this is unusual time. And so our goal is to try to survive it. And there's lots of things that we do already as families that are educational. And there's some great resources out that are that can help people just in the course of the things that we're doing already throughout our day that they're educational. So we might expand how we tell stories. We might include kids in, in cooking so we can do math and textures or whatever the things are that we're trying to do that are learning. And if we don't get all of the details in, I mean, that's okay. It's This is a temporary thing. We need to get through it and we'll figure it out at the other end. So I, I like to remind folks that we don't have to, we're not trying to replace it. We're trying to accommodate this unusual time. Those are good points. A lot of our listeners are they're writing in that they agree that we're not replacing, we're not replacing school right now. Thank you. Um, we'll just take one last question before we sign off. So, do you have any recommendations um, for schools or child cares for re-entry for the children who'll be re-entering after this time period? Yeah, it, we're ready to, well, in some places we've already started to do that. I think a lot of the things that we talked about, about coping with the situation that we're in now can come to play as we start to re-enter. Um, being frank uh, with children about what we do know and don't know, modeling positive coping, explaining what we're doing and why we're doing it. And uh, we are staying, we're not getting really close to each other. I think all of those things will be beneficial in terms of preparing kids to understand what it's going to be like when we go back um, and how things will be the same and how things will be different. And then um, the points about taking care of ourselves and monitoring our own reactions, I think will be really valuable here. I'm imagining, we're imagining our clinics um, where we would do lots of evaluations for developmental disorders with young children. And we're, you know, imagining that it'll be hard for young children to wear a mask and we're creating contingency plans for what we will do when, you know, the inevitable happens and the child removes the mask. So I think that piece of it as well, having some um, plan A and B and C um, will all be helpful. And the last thing I'll say is uh, some forgiveness and some grace would be really helpful for all of us because this isn't going to go perfectly. So we want to give ourselves a little space for the messes, messes that are going to happen um, and just be ready for that as we move ahead. And not to be self-serving, but I think going back to the idea of some sort of pause framework the, with the notion being <laughs> that to slow down and to try to understand and, and whether it's not only the anticipation and, but ahead of time thinking about it, but even when kids come in to try to understand what's happening from their perspective may inform us on things that we need to do or shift or change or how, how they're going to experience this when it does happen. We won't know all the answers ahead of time, but maybe the answers are that we go about it slowly with grace and we are flexible and we, we just make a change mm -hmm. as it comes along and then we can be the most successful. Great. Thank you so much, Angie and Steve, for sharing. This was really helpful. And thank you to everyone who joined us today and listening. We so we you have, have one a... thought we want to share, which sure. is this. So go ahead, Angie. Angie loves these quotes. So we want to share this with you as, as we end our talk. Okay. Um, so the long quote is this, courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow or in the simple format, our friend Corey, just keep swimming. This is what we're doing now. 
but it's not what we're doing forever, I hope. <laughs> very true. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And everyone have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.